Hello everyone, today I'm discussing physiology and pharmacology of the neuromuscular junction. So boring stuff, I'm an Australian intensive care trainee preparing for my primary exam. I do not have any financial conflicts of interest regarding drugs, devices, books or other literature. Image in the background is part of a stunning illustration by David Goodsell in 2009, which I had to include. The link will be in the description. Apart from its obvious artistic merit, I think the most striking feature of this image is that the neuromuscular junction is not just empty space, it's packed full of intricate basement membrane proteins and cholinesterase enzyme. So the scope of this video blew out a little. I'm going to start with a quick overview of membrane and action potentials. The physiology of how this translates to transmission from motor neurons across the neuromuscular junction to trigger an action potential in skeletal muscle, and how this action potential triggers muscle contraction known as excitation-contraction coupling. I'm going to outline different types of motor units and how their recruitment combines with frequency coding to regulate muscle tension. Then I'll look closer at the pre-junctional nerve terminal with some pathophysiology and toxicology before moving on to the neuromuscular synapse itself and talking about myasthenia gravis. I'll talk about other places acetylcholine is used and how this is relevant for pharmacology. I'll have a quick rant about succinylcholine and then move on to reviewing and comparing the different non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. After that, I'll talk about acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and how they're used to treat myasthenia gravis, reverse neuromuscular bl blockade, and murder things. Then the drugs used to reverse their muscarinic side effects. And finally, we'll talk about the game-changing reversal agent Sagamidex, and demonstrate how nerve stimulators can be used to assess the depth of neuromuscular blockade. We start with the hero of my last video, the sodium potassium ATPase, which is still tirely working to keep sodium mostly outside and potassium mostly inside the cell through primary active transport. It's joined by the sodium calcium exchanger, which uses sodium's transmembrane gradient to efflux calcium out of the cell. This is secondary active transport. NCX is helped by the plasma membrane calcium ATPase, or PMCA. Its cousin circle will be mentioned later. These pumps are major drivers of numerous transmembrane ionic gradients, which I summarized here. If the membrane was permeable to any one ion, entropy would favor its diffusion to dissipate the gradient. Because these ions carry charge, diffusion will only proceed to a certain extent until it generates such a membrane, transmembrane voltage that prevents further diffusion. The voltage is the equilibrium potential. For example, these K2P channels increase the membrane permeability to potassium, which follows its concentration gradient out of the cell. This is known as facilitated diffusion because it happens passively, but with the help of a channel. As the positive charges travel out across the membrane, the inside of the membrane develops a negative charge relative to the outside, approaching potassium's equilibrium potential of about minus 95 millivolts. After a relatively very small amount of potassium crosses, the charge means that further diffusion is no longer favourable. Along with smaller contributions from sodium and chloride, this generates the resting membrane potential, which is about minus 80 millivolts for human skeletal and cardiac muscle, around minus 70 for neurons, and around minus 55 for smooth muscle cells. Now we move on to action potentials for which uh, we need to take a look at voltage-gated ion channels, in this case, sodium channel. This is a representation um, of the channels found in nerves and muscle. They have a so-called selectivity filter, which means that the pore heavily favors the facilitated diffusion of their chosen ion, though they're not perfect. A hugely important concept, especially for sodium channels, is the idea of multiple gates, which create, very simply put, at least three functional states for the channel closed, open, and inactivated. The top gate is known as either the voltage or activation gate. It is what creates a current when the channel detects depolarization. The lower gate is called the time or inactivation gate, which after a very short time, around 0.7 milliseconds, inactivates the channel and stops the current. This is responsible for the hard refractory period and stops positive feedback from causing a massive uncontrolled depolarization. This will be my representation of a potassium channel. For the purposes of this model, it doesn't require multiple gates, although in reality, many calcium and potassium channels have inactivation gates. Some sodium channels have multiple different types of inactivation, but we don't need to go into that. So how do they work? 
Remember, we have our membrane potential, it's about minus 80 millivolts, and we need a stimulating membrane depolarization, which reaches around minus 55 to minus 60 millivolts. Once this happens, the sodium voltage or activation gate rapidly opens and causes an influx of sodium ions and full depolarization of the membrane into the mildly positive range. After about 0.7 milliseconds, the time or inactivation gate closes, stopping the flow. Meanwhile, the depolarization activates the slightly slower voltage gated potassium channel. Even though the leak channels had previously reached an equilibrium, the new positive membrane potential allows even more so potassium to leave the cell. If you watch my diuretics video, you might remember ENAC and ROMK with sodium going in and potassium going out, which is the same principle essentially. Once the sodium channels are closed, this not only repolarizes, but um, hyperpolarizes the membrane, and this is the potassium I mean, bringing it even closer to the membrane potential for potassium, which is around minus 90. This part's quite important. Once the membrane is at least partially repolarized, usually after about one or two milliseconds, the inactivation gates of the sodium channels are allowed to reset, which means that the channel can be activated again. But the potassium-induced hyperpolarization creates a relative refractory period. <clears throat> Once the voltage-gated channels close, the active ion transport mechanisms return the membrane to its original state. As the membrane has many of these channels, a local depolarization will create an all or nothing action potential as illustrated here. Now what we haven't mentioned so far is calcium. Voltage gated calcium channels are typically used to convert electrical signals into cellular activity, such as neurotransmitter release or muscle contraction. The latter is known as excitation contraction coupling, which we'll look at as skeletal muscle soon. This diagram represents a skeletal muscle cell at the site of a neuromuscular junction. Skeletal muscle cells are also known as muscle fibres and are very large multinuclear structures containing contractile filaments arranged in multiple bundles known as myofibrils. The functional unit of a myofibril is the sarcomere. You can see an illustration of one across the centre of the screen. I've shown the filaments in a simple alternating pattern uh, here for clarity, although in reality they're arranged in a more complex hexagonal structure, as you can see from the side. Looking at the structure of skeletal muscle, it's easy to see how these have been optimised for performance. The vast majority of the volume of the fibres is taken up by myofibrils. These are wrapped in a network of sarcoplasmic reticulum, which serves as a reservoir for calcium, and T-tubules, which are deep invaginations of the plasma membrane that carry action potentials from the surface. Together, they're known as triads. They're even closer together uh, across the sarcomeres than shown here. I've had to expand it somewhat for clarity again. Even the mitochondria form complex branch structure, structures around the myofibrils known as reticula. At the top of the screen, we can see a prejunctional nerve terminal. It supplies signals from its lower motor neuron body in the anterior horn of the spinal cord or cranial nerve equivalent. Each nerve cell supplies a number of fibres of the same muscle type, designated as a motor unit. The axons are myelinated, which means that the action potentials we've just looked at only exist between the myelinated sections, the so-called nodes of Ranvier. The mechanism of transmission between nodes is called saltatory conduction, which literally means jumping. Essentially, this involves transmission of the current in the form of movement of ions in short-range circuits, rather than relying on propagation across directly adjacent membranes. This reduces the capacitance of the axon membrane and greatly increases its efficiency, allowing transmission speeds about 20 times faster with a lower energy cost. I should clarify regarding current. An ion current across a membrane involves the literal flow of ions. Saltatory conduction does not require a potassium ion to find its way all the way down between the nodes in an axon. It's more like a wavefront that travels faster than any one particle. For example, in an electrical wire, current travels at nearly the speed of light, but the individual electrons overall move at a rate of millimetres per second. A common analogy is marbles in a pipe. If you put a marble in one end, the um, barely moves um, 
it barely moves the marbles um, individually, but the uh, signal is almost instantaneous. This is a massive simplification and the real picture probably involves much more complex circuits, at least um, something like the double cable model. But for what we're interested, what we're really interested in is what happens next, which is that the depolarization reaches the neuromuscular junction. This is a simplified close-up view of the neuromuscular junction itself. Within the presynaptic nerve terminal, there are synaptic vesicles containing acetylcholine waiting to be released. Each vesicle has about two to 3,000 molecules of acetylcholine. The vesicles are typically lined up in parallel rows. One to two percent of the vesicles will be ready to release at a given time. 10 to 20 percent will be docked nearby in the active zones. The remainder will be stored deeper in the cytosol. Specific P slash Q type voltage gated calcium channels are located adjacent to the release sites. You can see examples of the numerous proteins that regulate vesicle transport and fusion, including the so-called snare proteins. Once an action potential arrives, the voltage gated calcium channels couple this electrical signal to those cellular mechanisms. Specifically, the localized increase in intracellular calcium activates synaptotagmin which triggers the snare proteins to form a fusion complex with the cell membrane, dumping acetylcholine into the synaptic space. It's incredibly sensitive. One source suggested six to eight ions of calcium could be enough to trigger vesicle release. After their release, acetylcholine is very rapidly broken down by acetylcholinesterase, but enough of it makes it across the synapse for the molecules to briefly bind to each of the two alpha subunits of postsynaptic nicotinic receptors activating the channel. The nicotinic receptor is a non-specific ligand gated cation channel permeable to sodium, potassium and calcium to some extent. Due to the electrochemical gradient, the current is primarily an influx of sodium, although there'll be a small potassium efflux as the membrane depolarizes. Acetylcholine binds reversibly and will quickly diffuse back into the synaptic space where it's destroyed. By now, it's, its job is done and the depolarization opens nearby 1.4 type voltage gated sodium channels and a postsynaptic action potential is formed. Looking at the same process from our broader view, the presynaptic action potential leads to calcium influx and a pulse of acetylcholine release. This triggers an action potential on the skeletal muscle plasma membrane or sarcolemma, which travels deep into the fiber via the continuous T-tubules. We're now following a T-tubule deep into the muscle fiber. It forms a canal of sarcolemma and extracellular fluid designed to carry action potentials. The T-tubule is flanked by a sarcoplasmic reticulum, which functions as the fiber's calcium stockpile. Circa is an ATP driven pump that returns calcium to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, keeping the cytosolic calcium concentration low between contraction signals. The ACPase uses around 40% of resting muscle energy metabolism, which is over 10% of total metabolism for most people. You'll notice a different type of calcium channel along the membrane of the T tubule. These are simply known as dihydropyridine receptors and are distinct from the L-type calcium channels on smooth or cardiac muscle, but serve a relatively similar function. In other muscle cells, an influx of extracellular calcium triggers ryanidine receptors, which release additional calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In skeletal muscle, the dihydropyridine receptors are mechanically coupled to the ryanidine receptors, so they can be triggered without any actual calcium influx. So once an action potential depolarizes the T-tubule, there's an immediate signal for calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium-induced calcium release was first described in skeletal muscle and probably plays some role in amplifying the signal, but its contribution to this wave of calcium release is unclear. Mutations in ryanidine receptors and some associated proteins are the primary predisposing factor for malignant hypothermia, a life-threatening hypermetabolic state involving massive sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium release and skeletal muscle activation. It's primarily triggered by succinylcholine and volatile halogenated anesthetic agents, although it's affected by certain physiological and, and environmental factors as well. The specific treatment is dantrolene, which inhibits ryanidine receptors. Calcium couples membrane excitation to muscle contraction, 
In skeletal and cardiac muscle, contraction is regulated on the actin filaments rather than myosin. Troponin I, T and C form complexes associated with tropomyosin, which covers the myosin binding sites on actin. Following membrane depolarization, a wave of calcium arrives from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium ions bind to troponin C. This causes a conformational change in the troponin complex, which displaces tropomyosin from the myosin binding sites. Now myosin heads are able to attach with ADP and phosphate. Phosphate dissociates, triggering a power stroke and mechanical work. ADP is exchanged for a new ATP, triggering dissociation from the filament. The ATP is hydrolyzed and the myosin head undergoes another conformational change. Looking back at the level of the sarcomere, calcium binds to the troponin C sites, leading to the conformational change and sliding filament contraction through myosin ATPase activity, as we just saw. Following contraction, circa activity returns calcium to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium leaves the troponin complexes, covering up the myosin binding sites. And this leads to relaxation of the filaments. The force generated by muscle contraction depends on the frequency of action potential signals which dynamically influence the concentration of calcium, as well as the length of the muscle at the time, which affects the degree of overlap of the actin and myosin filaments. Skeletal muscle typically stays within the 75% and 125% of its optimal length for force generation, ensuring a reasonable amount of force generation for most movements. The teal line represents active force generation. If muscle is stretched, mechanical tension provides an additional passive force. This is a twitch, the tensile response of a muscle fiber to one action potential. It consists of a brief latent period followed by active contraction, as we've just seen, and finally relaxation associated with calcium airflux. Muscle units are often described based on time to peak concentration and then half relaxation time because of its exponential lag decay pattern. As the frequency of twitches increases, you have summation of generated force manifesting as unfused or incomplete tetanus, and then finally complete tetanus at frequencies above 20 to 50 Hertz. Muscle reaches its peak force generation with sustained tetanus four to 10 times that of a single twitch. The specific time force relationship depends on the subtype of muscle fiber, one, two A or two B. These were initially classified as slow twitch or fast twitch, but as it turns out, there's two subtypes of fast twitch. Annoyingly, there's about four different names for the same subtypes. I've outlined them here mainly. So if you see one description, you can tell that they're referring to the same thing. Functionally, they're classified as slow twitch, fast fatigue resistant, FR, and fast fatigable, FF. You can also classify based on the type of myosin heavy chain, which differs between fibers. Another system is based on metabolic utilization. So SO is slow oxidative because it's slow twitch and uses primarily oxidative metabolism, i.e. using fatty acids and carbohydrates with oxygen to generate ATP. FOG means it uses both oxidative and glycolytic pathway, which is faster but much lower yield. Finally, FG is fast glycolytic because it doesn't have time to wait for blood flow or oxygen. The faster fibers also use phosphocreatine, which is a stored form of ATP and even faster to access. If you find this stuff really interesting, I recommend my first video on the playlist on bioenergetics. Notice how I've colored the table. Type 1 fibers have a higher myoglobin content and are therefore darker red in color. They also have the most mitochondria and receive the most blood flow because they're so dependent on oxygen delivery and cellular respiration. If you eat meat, you might have an easier time conceptualizing this because muscles with a lot of type 1 fibers are considered red meat, while muscles with a lot of type 2B fibers are considered white meat. 2A fibers are intermediate and I'd consider them pink. The wisest meat I could find is domestic chicken breast, which is almost entirely composed of type 2B muscle fibers. This is because chickens hardly ever fly, only using it for emergencies, and when they do, they fly briefly. The longest recorded chicken flight was apparently 13 seconds, 
but around five seconds is more typical. In comparison, duck breast is a much darker meat because ducks can fly long distances and need a larger mix of oxidative fibres. So what's the advantage of fast twitch fibres, particularly 2B? Well, they can generate much more force much faster. The motor units also tend to be larger, that is more fibres per motor neuron. These are the sprinter muscles. The fastest 100 meter runners can compete in, complete the race in just under 10 seconds. As they are mostly relying on fast twitch muscles, most of the energy is expended independent of oxygen. I've previously stated that nearly all metabolic energy comes from oxygen, and it ultimately does, but in the moment the movements take place faster. That's why you might feel out of breath after, for, for a while after a brief exercise. The body is catching up on the energy you just spent, recharging the creatine phosphate stores, for example. Weightlifters also rely on 2B fibres, as they provide the most force for a brief period. Fast twitch fibres are found in relatively high ratios, above two thirds, in large force generating muscles like rectus femoris or the triceps of the arm. Meanwhile, slow twitch type 1 fibres are found in postural muscles like those of the back, as well as muscles for fine movements such as those of the fingers. These in include adductor pollicis, which is about 80% type 1 and will be relevant later, as well as the soleus. The soleus muscle has the highest ratio of type 1 fibres in humans, around 80%, as it's required for standing upright for long periods. Classic sports that utilise slow twitch muscle fibres are long distance running and cycling. Exercise training can alter the proportion of different muscle fibres to a certain extent. Now there's an extremely specialised subtype that deserves a mention here. Those are facial and especially extraocular muscles which would otherwise be considered type 2B fibres as they are extremely fast and high frequency. Despite this, the extraocular muscles are unique as they are relatively fatigue resistant and have a larger number of motor nerves per muscle fibre, around a 1 to 15 ratio. They contract with a much smaller amplitude but at very high frequency, up to about 170 Hz far higher than other muscle fibres, giving extremely smooth, precise movements. In general, type 1 fibres are picked first for contraction. This should make sense as they're used for slow, precise movements, maintained for long periods without tiring. As larger amounts of force are required, type 2A and finally type 2B fibres are utilised. Type 2B fibres need to be the last choice as they can only be used for a short time. For example, the diaphragm, which needs to contract and relax continuously, is a mix of fast and slow twitch muscle fibres, but the slow fibres are active all of the time, while the fast twitch fibres are only used for more forceful movement, such as when straining or breathing heavily. This brings us to the topic of motor units. As stated before, a motor unit is a motor neuron and the various muscle fibres it supplies. A motor neuron will only stimulate one subtype of muscle fibres. As a result, the motor units can be described as belonging to one of the subtypes, type 1, type 2A, or 2B. Specifically, these are alpha motor neurons, the ones that stimulate muscle fibres uh, directly uh, via the neuromuscular junction. So how does the central nervous system tell a muscle to contract and how much force to generate? It uses two main variables, action potential frequency and the recruitment of motor units sometimes called temporal recruitment and spatial recruitment respectively. Increase in the number of motor units and frequency happens simultaneously, but the recruitment of units tends to take priority early, and then after all the units are recruited, the frequency will increase further. There are a couple of principles about what units are recruited when. For example, as we mentioned, slow fibers are recruited before faster fibers. Related to this, smaller motor units, that is, nerves supplying less fibres, are specifically recruited before larger units. This is called the size principle and allows the finest possible motor control for soft movements with relatively less control as force increases. Regarding frequency, the weakest neural stimuli lead to irregular action potentials at around 2 to 3 hertz, which become regular and more stable at around 5 to 7 hertz. As the stimulus increases, contraction frequency might increase from 6 to 10 Hz as more units are recruited simultaneously.
Some later units are added at a higher starting frequency. Once most units are contracting, maximal force is achieved by increasing frequency up to full tetanic contraction. If you remember the previous slide, different fibre types take longer to contract, so tetany will happen at lower frequencies, around 10 Hz for type 1 fibres, versus 25 to 60 Hz for some fast twitch fibres. This might all sound complicated, but watch how most of these principles can be integrated with the recruitment of three different motor units, each with a starting frequency. We'll start with the recruitment of a small type 1 motor unit. These contract at relatively low frequencies and provide a low steady force. As the stimulus um, to generate force increases, you start to have recruitment of type 2A and then finally type 2B units with increasing size, force and frequency. After the peak force is generated, the units are de-recruited in the reverse order with the most fatigable units contracting for the shortest time. In addition to alpha motor neurons, there are also gamma motor neurons, which modulate motor function by tensing the muscle spindle. There are numerous afferent sensory fibers, which return via the dorsal horn and provide feedback directly or via interneurons. These provide a great deal of intermediate neural feedback at the level of the spinal cord and are responsible for spinal reflexes. Obviously, these motor neurons and interneurons um, receive um, a great deal of input from above, primarily the motor cortex, which forms part of the various feedback and control loops involving the cerebellum and basal ganglia, which are way beyond the scope of this video. For context, at the end of this video, I'm going to discuss neuromuscular monitoring and nerve stimulation. This artificially induces an action potential in an entire nerve at once, so all motor neurons are involved and spatial recruitment is eliminated, Leading, leaving only frequency coding. The frequency is controlled artificially, usually slow twitches at 1 to 2 Hz or tetany at 50 Hz or above. That's um, most of the physiology done for now. We're going to discuss some pharmacology and pathology. There's plenty of overlap with toxicology as well because some of the diseases involve toxins and many of the drugs we're about to discuss are considered poisons. Some of them are pretty notorious. To start with the most potent of all, um, botulinum uh, toxin, uh, for example, this toxin A acts on presynaptic nerve terminals at the neuromuscular junction. They're proteins made by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. They cause the diseases food, wound and infantile botulism based on the route of entry, with foodborne botulism being the most common. The peptide toxins are endocytosed after binding to a protein receptor called SV2. The toxins have a heavy chain and a light chain. Once inside the nerve terminal, the light chain detaches and starts destroying components of the snare complex. The different toxins have different cleavage targets and sites. For example, toxin A affects the SNAP25 protein. The proteolytic light chain can remain active inside the nerve terminal for a long time, three to 11 weeks in one study. Without a functional snare complex, the nerve cannot release acetylcholine causing skeletal muscle paralysis. Treatment of botulism is mostly supportive. Most clinical improvement occurs within three months and the median duration of mechanical ventilation when required is about 14 days. Most major electrolyte disturbances will also have some effect on skeletal muscle. For example, hypokalemia causes muscle weakness and rhabdomyolysis. Hypophosphatemia also causes rhabdomyolysis. Hypocalcemia causes tetany through a generalized effect on nerve and muscle excitability. One that's particularly relevant at the neuromuscular junction is hypermagnesemia, which can specifically inhibit acetylcholine release by competing with calcium at the PQ um, voltage-gated calcium channels. Symptomatic hypermagnesemia is often iatrogenic, particularly when high-dose magnesium is given in obstetrics. It's also a significant risk in patients with renal failure and can exacerbate myasthenia gravis. The treatment for magnesium-related muscle weakness is additional calcium to overcome the competition.
Another significant presynaptic pathology is the Lambert-Eaton myasthenia, myasthenia syndrome, where antibodies are produced to the particular P slash Q type calcium channels present in the nerve terminal. This prevents the necessary calcium influx to activate acetylcholine release. LEMS is often a perineoplastic syndrome and is associated with small cell lung cancer in approximately 50% of cases. It is often relatively mild, especially compared to myasthenia gravis. Apart from evaluating for and treating any underlying malignancy, one treatment for LEMS is an obscure family of chemicals that block the presynaptic 3.3 uh, and 3.4 type voltage-gated potassium channels, which repolarize the membrane. By extending the period of repolarization, the cell has a chance for more calcium influx and a greater chance of activating vesicle release. Doubling the amount of active zone calcium influx can cause a 16-fold increase in neurotransmitter release. The condition can also be modified with cholinesterase inhibitors to some extent, which I'll discuss shortly. Looking back at the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine release happens as a brief pulse sufficient to activate the nicotinic receptors, depolarize the end plate and initiate an action potential before it's broken down. The main idea is that a huge amount of acetylcholine is released and immediately destroyed by acetylcholinesterase so that it can depolarize the motor end plate and be gone within about a millisecond. The amount that activates the nicotinic receptors is about three to five times greater than the minimum required to, to cause depolarization known as a safety factor. There are actually receptors nicotinic receptors on both membranes. The usual postsynaptic receptors have two alpha-1 subunits, a beta-1, an epsilon, and a delta. The presynaptic receptors have two alpha-3 subunits and three beta-2 subunits. They serve to further depolarize the membrane as positive feedback during acetylcholine release. In particular, this helps to advance stored vesicles for release with repeat action potentials, and it's likely responsible for an effect called fade with non-depolarizing muscle relaxants that we'll see later. Looking at the structure of acetylcholine, it's an ester composed of the quaternary ammonium structure choline plus acetic acid. Cholinesterase breaks it back down to those components, which are recycled by the neuron in a two-step, it's broken down in a two-step process that we'll look at in more detail later. We need two acetylcholine to activate a nicotinic receptor. If we take two of them, and fuse them together, we will get succinylcholine, which is the most controversial neuromuscular blocking agent in critical care. The name derives from the fact that the center section resembles succinic acid. As a drug, it's more commonly referred to as succimethonium or simply sux. It makes a bit less sense, but the sux parts probably derive from succinyl as well. Methonium ref refers to a um, more general structure. In fact, the simplified molecule decamethonium is also a depolarizing muscle relaxant, although it's no longer in clinical use. So how does a depolarizing muscle relaxant work? First, it's administered systemically and diffuses from the systemic compartment to um, the neuromuscular junction, activating the postsynaptic receptors. As with acetylcholine, it does create an action potential that reaches the sarcomeres and causes contraction, although it keeps occupying the receptors. Succinylcholine is not broken down by acetylcholinesterase in the synapse. Um, it's instead broken down by um, plasma cholinesterase, known as butyral cholinesterase, which happens much slower than acetylcholinesterase breaking down um, acetylcholine, but still fast enough that about 10% of the administered succinylcholine survives to reach the site of axon. The key to how it functions as a muscle relaxant is in the postsynaptic sodium channels. Voltage-gated sodium channels cannot remain open indefinitely because the inactivation gate closes regardless of the membrane potential. Because it keeps activating the nicotinic receptors, succinylcholine creates an island of depolarized membrane at the end plate. Because the membrane is still relatively positive in the minus 30 to minus 60 range, the voltage gate in the sodium channel doesn't close and the inactivation gate can't reset. This creates a firebreak of inactivated sodium channels that cannot transmit an action potential to the rest of the membrane. 
This mode of action creates the one and I mean one advantage of this class, which is that it's easier to light a fire than smother one. Specifically, um, it takes a lot less of a depolarizing muscle relaxant at the end plate um, to create the block effect, about 20% receptor occupancy, which means that instead of looking like a fire blanket, it's actually more like this, sort of dancing around between them and with several receptors not occupied um, because, um, because it's not competing with acetylcholine. In fact, acetylcholine at the receptor site will enhance at the onset of the block. For example, um, there is an urban legend about uh, called sucks racing, um, where bored doctors inject themselves with succinothonium and see how far they can run before they collapse and need to get hand ventilated for five minutes. Part of the apparent strategy to this is that the more effort you spend running creates more acetylcholine at the synapse and depolarizes the muscle faster, accelerating the paralysis. So it's, it's a real trade-off and it's really stupid and I don't know if it's ever happened, but don't try it. You want a muscle relaxant to work quickly because it helps facilitate intubation and mechanical ventilation and makes you apneic in the process. So if the patient is at risk of aspiration or rapid desaturation, you want the time from breathing normally to optimally paralyzed to be as rapid as possible. For a drug to work, you need an adequate number of molecules to diffuse from the blood to the effect site. And for depolarizing agents, an adequate number is much lower because so they're always going to have an advantage in terms of speed of onset. This means that you can give succinylcholine intramuscularly, although at four times the dose, in the event of an RSI or laryngospasm without IV access, and you'll get a reasonable time of onset of about one to two minutes. Succinylcholine is broken down usually relatively quickly by plasma cholinesterase, also known as butyrol cholinesterase. Once enough of it's broken down, the diffusion gradient reverses and the drug finally leaves the receptors, allowing the membrane to reset. It works well enough, but you do get some complications if you try using repeat doses or if the plasma cholinesterase is not functioning. To push our analogy even further, the fighting fire with fire strategy is known as phase one block. But after a while, the firefighters are going to start complaining that they'd really like something other than fire to fight the fire because it's been going for so long that nothing's growing there at all. You start developing multiple effects, both pre and post synaptically, including down regulation of receptors by muscle and repolarization using, of the membrane using the sodium potassium ATPase, which means that not only is the depolarization block less effective, but you start developing um, a picture that resembles more of a non-depolarizing block known as phase two, um, which is a sort of overarching term for this phenomenon. The, um, this also means that in the transition phase, you can have um, succinylcholine um, antagonizing itself, which is part of the contributing factor to tachyphylaxis. Now let's look at a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent like vecuronium. This is the fire blanket approach. It's much more intuitive and acts like a traditional competitive antagonist. It looks enough like acetylcholine to bind the nicotinic receptors, but not enough to open the channel. There are some more complicated facets because receptors have a desensitized state. They can oscillate between, but generally you can think of it as simple competition. Because you have this decoy acetylcholine, when it's released, the not enough acetylcholine reaches the nicotinic receptors and the probability of achieving a muscle action potential is reduced. If you want to quantify it further, if the concentration of the antagonist is doubled, the acetylcholine concentration would need to be four times higher to get the signal through. As already stated, the main disadvantage of this approach is that you need more molecules at the site which means the effects comes on a little slower. But if you give a large dose, this difference is about 15 seconds and none of the agents we use today have the assortment of side effects that succinylcholine does, which range from inconvenient to lethal.
most non-depolarizing muscle relaxants um, also block presynaptic nicotinic receptors in reducing acetylcholine release with repeat stimuli. This is thought to cause the decreased twitch amplitude in response to repeat stimuli known as fade, which is a useful marker of whether this sort of blockade is present. On a related topic, myasthenia gravis is a disease that replicates the effect of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. The typical pathophysiology is that lymphocytes are sensitized to muscle-like cells in the thymus and create antibodies to components of the motor end plate, usually the nicotinic receptors themselves. The antibodies are polyclonal, which means they have different affinities and different IgG subtypes. Importantly, it's the antibodies that cause the disease, they're not just a marker. We know this because pregnant people with myasthenia gravis can have antibodies cross the placenta and cause myasthenia features in the infant. The antibodies reduce neuromuscular transmission in three ways. Firstly, it's possible they can compete with acetylcholine exactly like a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, although this is not the primary mechanism. Secondly, because the clusters of receptors are very dense, antibodies can bridge to receptors leading to endocytosis and downregulation. Finally, the most devastating mechanism involves complement ac activation. Quick side note on immunology, complement is an enzyme cascade in the blood similar to coagulation factors. After antibodies bind, the large C1 complex attaches to them on the surface. C1 activates C4 and C2 to C4B and C2A, which also attach to the surface. This is known as the classical pathway and triggers a cascade as factor 3 forms 3B. 3B can combine with um, factor B to amplify its own production even further, known as the alternative pathway. Eventually, 3B attaches and converts the 3A's complex um, into 5A's complexes, as in splitting 5, activating factor 5. And this is when all hell breaks loose because factor 5 is the first component of the membrane attack complex. It combines with factors 6, 7, and 8 before forming a ring of, uh, assembling with a ring of factor 9 molecules and rip open a hole in the membrane, exposing the cytoplasm to extracellular fluid. This mechanism is designed to kill invading cells and does not destroy the whole muscle fiber, but causes significant focal lysis at the end plate. This leaves a shallow dysfunctional motor end plate with far less nicotinic receptors. Plus, you still have the antibodies to deal with. Myasthenia gravis management is complicated and specialized and largely beyond the scope of this talk. 10% of patients have a thymoma, which will need treating, and for some other patients, it's recommended that the thymus be removed. Most patients receive some form of chronic immune suppressive therapy with corticosteroids, plus or minus sparing agents like azathioprine or mycophenolate. Patients in myasthenic crisis can be treated with acute immune suppression therapies like IVIG or plasma exchange. Obviously, the part I'm interested in here is symptomatic management, which involves acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Like I said, myasthenia gravis is functionally very similar to incomplete paralysis with a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. Because the end plate and nicotinic receptors are so damaged, when acetylcholine is released, it has a much harder time creating sufficient depolarization to cause an action potential in the muscle. Transmission of an action potential is a matter of probability. Imagine the original safety factor of three to five has been reduced to around one. This means that not all of them are going to get through and any further insult can cause clinically significant paralysis. The antibodies can also attack presynaptic receptors and because the safety factor is already so low, even a small physiological decline in acetylcholine release that comes with repetitive simulation means statistically less signals are going to be transmitted. This causes the core clinical feature of myasthenia gravis, which is fatigability. The most sensitive muscles in myasthenia gravis are the unique extraocular muscles, likely because of their very high frequency of stimulation and relatively low safety factor.
They also have more innovation, but less nicotinic receptors for a given end plate with less acetylcholine release per action potential. Interestingly, if a patient is in the unfortunate position of being conscious with an intermediate dose of non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, for example, from an excessive priming dose or an incomplete reversal, they often report diplopia as one of the earliest symptoms. Myasthenia gravis patients are in the dangerous position where any drug that further alters that safety factor, such as aminoglycosides or excess magnesium that reduce presynaptic acetylcholine release, can push them into a crisis. As you might imagine, people with myasthenia gravis are exquisitely sensitive to non-depolarizing muscle relaxants and relatively resistant to succinylcholine due to the reduced receptors. So how do we push it back the other way? Cholinesterase inhibitors work by temporarily inactivating acetylcholinesterase, and I'll talk about how they do that later. If you remember that the neuromuscular junction works by having hundreds of thousands of molecules released of acetylcholine, with most of them immediately broken down and a, few, a small fraction managing to reach the nicotinic receptor, you can probably imagine that inhibiting the um, destruction of the acetylcholine is an extremely powerful way to get acetyl more acetylcholine to the end plate. So in myasthenia gravis, cholinesterase inhibitors effectively increase the magnitude and duration of the acetylcholine pulse, restoring the safety factor and allowing depolarization. The mechanism works in exactly the same fashion for reversal of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. You might be thinking, well, this is fantastic. Why don't we all take them? I'll just snort some nerve gas and I'll make my safety factor a billion and I'll never have a problem. Well, there, there's, there's two main problems with that. And the first is that you want, you want just a spark, you, not a whole bonfire. Otherwise, you're going to get the same problem as succinylcholine. Um, it will, um, the dose of the cholinesterase inhibitors needs to be really carefully titrated to the symptoms of the patient because if you have excessive acetylcholine at the synapse, you will get paradoxical muscle, rela muscle weakness as it acts as a depolarizing muscle relaxant. And the second problem is the acetylcholine doesn't just act at the neuromuscular junction. Remember, this is a secret toxicology video because nearly all of the drug classes affecting acetylcholine are derived from well-known natural poisons. So, some botany. This is Nicotinia tobaccum. You can probably guess its common name. Nicotinic receptors are named as such because nicotine is an experimental agonist for them. The reason we don't see many effects from nicotine at the neuromuscular junction is that it has a relatively low affinity for that particular subtype. Like I mentioned, they are, they are made out of five subunits, which can be a mixture of various types like alpha-1, beta-1, epsilon-delta for adults, or the immature version, which has a gamma instead of an epsilon. Another common uh, family of nicotinic receptors feature two alpha subunits and three beta subunits, such as the alpha-3, beta-2 receptors that we saw on the presynaptic nerve terminal. The third main variety are homomeric, which just feature five alpha subunits, for example, alpha-7. Some textbooks classify nicotinic receptors as N1 and N2 for muscle and neural type, respectively. That's probably overly simplistic and very arbitrary because there's at least three different subtypes sometimes present on muscle. One of those is alpha-7, which is also present frequently on nerves. Overall, there's about 17 subunit genes for vertebrates in a couple of dozen combinations. I'll mention one more for now, which is alpha-3, beta-4, um, which is present on uh, postsynaptically at autonomic ganglia. Next, we have the nicotinic receptor agon antagonist, which is curare, um, derived from Strychnos toxifera, known as bush rope, among other names. Curare is actually a term for a group of alkaloid toxins, including toxiferine in this particular plant. When they act at neuromuscular junction, they are known as non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. 
Indigenous people in South America used curare toxins as arrow poisons for hunting for many hundreds of years. The animals were safe to eat because the toxins are not orally bioavailable. Another South American plant, Condo Chondrodendron tomentosum, gave us the curare toxin, tubo curare. This is because this became the first chemically isolated drug to be used as a muscle relaxant in medicine, although it's now considered obsolete as later synthetic agents had fewer side effects. Now the next toxin comes from the Calabar bean, named after a region in present day Nigeria. The bean was known to be highly toxic when eaten by humans and traditionally was used as an ordeal poison for trials and duels. It contains physostigmine, the prototypical cholinesterase inhibitor. After that, we have a fungus, the beautiful fly agaric mushroom, which contains muscarin, an agonist and namesake um, for the G protein coupled acetylcholine receptors. Muscarinic receptors have two major subgroups, M1, 3, and 5 are linked to G-alpha Q11 pathway, which is the uh, intracellular calcium protein kinase C activation um, pathway. These reduce membrane potassium conductance and increase the likelihood of depolarization, making them stimulatory. Meanwhile, M2 and M4 are linked to the IOG proteins, inhibiting adenylate cyclase and increasing potassium conduction via GERC, inhibiting membrane depolarization. These receptors are central to the function of the parasympathetic nervous system and are also present throughout the central nervous system. One more plant. Atropa belladonna, or deadly nightshade, gave us the drug atropine, the prototypical muscarinic receptor antagonist. Atropa comes from the fate, Atropos, who cut the thread of life in Greek mythology. Belladonna means beautiful lady, because the madriasis it caused, topically, was thought to make women more attractive. Atropine's toxic properties were recognized by at least the, at least the 4th century BC, with extracts being used in ancient Greece, Egypt, and Rome. You can probably guess from the names of the receptors that these toxins helped us discover how cholinergic physiology works. It started a long practice of um, using poisons to antagonize other poisons, which continues to this day. In the 1800s, Europeans had been studying physostigmine and found it to be useful for glaucoma. In 1864 in Prague, five prisoners drank from a bottle that turned out to contain atropine extract. The prison doctor Ludwig Kleinwatcher um, was tasked with saving the dying men and consulted an ophthalmologist um, colleague who suggested trying physostigmine. All of the men woke up from their comas and survived. In 1816, it was, had been shown that the paralyzing effect of curare on animals was non-fatal if respiration was supported. This led to them using um, curare to immobilize animals in the testing of other, during the testing of other drugs. In 1900, an Austrian physiologist named J. Pal injected physostigmine into a curarized dog to study the effect on gut motility. It did increase peristalsis due to its promuscarinic effect, but to his surprise, the dog also started breathing. At this point, we have the makings of a reversal algorithm. Physostigmine reverses the non-depolarizing muscle relaxant by increasing acetylcholine, but causes muscarinic side effects. Those can be treated with the muscarinic antagonist atropine. In the 1930s, Mary Walker, a Scottish physician studying patients with myasthenia gravis, proposed that there was an endogenous curare-like substance in their blood. Having heard of Pell's findings, she injected a patient with physostigmine, causing a dramatic improvement in the symptoms. After even better results with an analog neostigmine, she helped to develop peridostigmine, which could be taken orally and is used as a first-line treatment today.
Succinylcholine or succinylmethanium is in the unusual class of depolarizing muscle relaxants and is therefore a nicotinic agonist like acetylcholine and nicotine. It is also an agonist at muscarinic M2 receptors, often causing bradycardia. Succinylcholine is broken down by a different cholinesterase known as butyral cholinesterase and formerly pseudocholinesterase. This circulates in plasma and does not appear to be essential for life. Many acetyl cholinesterase inhibitors such as physostigmine inhibit this enzyme as well. This plasma cholinesterase is not to be confused with acetyl cholinesterase attached to red blood cells which is the same as that found in cholinergic synapses. Both of them have been used in blood testing as markers of nerve agent exposure, with red blood cell cholinesterase activity being more clinically relevant. So now, now we know what the different receptors, agonists and antagonists do, the next question is where? This is an overview of nicotinic receptor subtypes in the brain, which I stole from a Nature article. As you can see, there's a lot. The main ones are alpha-4, beta-2 and the homomeric alpha-7. Acetylcholine is a major neurotransmitter in the central nervous system and acts on both nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. M1 is probably the most significant, but in some areas like the hippocampus have all five. M2 and M4 often provide negative feedback on presynaptic cholinergic neurons. We won't look at the intricacies of what does what where because the drugs involved are pretty blunt instruments. Nicotine is primarily active as a CNS stimulant in, and in reward behaviours, but can cause seizures and coma in high doses. Neuromuscular blockers, thankfully, do not typically enter the CNS, although from rat experiments and a couple of drug errors, they are considered neurotoxic and can cause seizures potentially. Low doses of centrally acting cholinesterase inhibitors can provide symptomatic treatment improvement in Alzheimer's disease. More toxic agents can cause tremor, seizures, anxiety, depression of respiratory centers, as well as long-term neuropsychiatric sequelae. Muscarinic agonist pilocarpine causes status epilepticus in animal studies. M1 antagonist benztropine is used to treat some Parkinson's-like movement disorders, though it can cause significant sedation. And non-specific antimuscarinics such as atropine and scopolamine cause profound delirium and coma in higher doses. In short, most of them cause altered mental status, some cause seizures. Thankfully, many cholinergic and anticholinergics have quaternary ammonium structures and cannot cross the blood-brain barrier to a clinically significant extent. This does become important if you are trying to antagonize a toxic agent, which does. Otherwise, we've already talked extensively about somatic neurotransmission, which is your spinal motor neurons to the neuromuscular junction and use those re nicotinic receptors as described. We also have the autonomic nervous system where it gets a bit more interesting. We tend to associate acetylcholine with parasympathetic nervous system, but it's actually important for both branches. In both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, you typically have a proximal neuron, then a cholinergic synapse in a ganglion with an alpha-3, beta-4 nicotinic receptor um, stimulating a distal neuron. In the parasympathetic system, the distal neuron also re releases acetylcholine, which activates muscarinic receptors. In short, M1, 3, and 5 tend to activate glandular secretion and smooth muscle contraction. M2 and M4 are inhibitory, most notably for the M2 receptors on the heart. On the sympathetic side, you have functionally the same ganglia with the same nicotinic receptors, although the distal neurons typically release noradrenaline, norepinephrine, to adrenergic G-protein coupled receptors um, instead of muscarinic receptors. There are a couple of odd exceptions though. In the skin, some distal sympathetic nerves actually release acetylcholine and those activate 
M3 muscarinic receptors stimulating pilo erection and sweat release. In the adrenal medulla, you only have one cholinergic neuron which activates the same ganglionic receptors and stimulates the release of adrenaline. You can probably think of this a bit like an autonomic ganglion. All of these sites are potential opportunities for cholinergic or anticholinergic side effects. As I just said, many of the drugs originated as poisons, but neuromuscular blocking agents take this further. They are not even drugs unless used in expert critical care environments. Otherwise, they are just poisons like curare or botulinum. There are very few drugs that will kill a patient this reliably at a therapeutic dose unless specific steps are performed and it's not a nice death either. This has significant implications for patient safety. There have been far too many cases of muscle relaxants being accidentally administered instead of more benign drugs inside and outside of an anaesthetic setting. Rocuronium has been mistaken for ezimeprazole because the brand name is Esmeron. Vecuronium has been given uh, instead of midazolam because they were looking for Versed in a very high profile case. In probably the worst example, 15 children died in Syria seven years ago when atricurium was used to reconstitute measles vaccines because the vials look similar to sterile water. A lot of manufacturers produce vecuronium and vancomycin in the same packaging and they're probably going to be next to each other in an ICU medication room. In Australia, packaging has now been standardised so that all muscle relaxants have a warning prominently in red saying paralysing agent on the box, on the lid and on the label. It's recommended that the medications also be physically seg segregated like in the plastic containers shown here. These can still be dangerous when administered as intended. This is just a basic science video. If you're using these independently, you obviously need to be competent at the procedural elements of airway management. I do just want to make one more point, and this should really go without saying, it is inhumane to administer these drugs to patients unless combined with sedation or anesthesia. This does not just imply on induction, where, and it's where the pharmacokinetics become very important. I've heard people describe unexpectedly prolonged neuromuscular blockade as the patient not waking up. This could not be more wrong. The patient is awake and they're probably terrified. PTSD is a very common uh, consequence of awake paralysis. The highest risk situations are probably with the use of intermediate duration agents like rocuronium or vecuronium in a non-perioperative setting. For example, an intubation in the emergency department or transport of ventilated patient. If a patient is well sedated, they are unlikely to need paralysis and it should never be used because the patient is inadequately sedated. A more subtle and probably more common issue is inadequate reversal of paralysis um, in the operative setting, which I'll discuss later. So how do we classify these drugs? We have depolarizing and non-depolarizing, and then you can break them up by chemical structure and duration of action. Depolarizing is easy. We only have one that is amazingly still in use, which is succinylcholine or succinylmethanium. I'll discuss its idiosyncrasies further in the next slide. It's considered to be an ultra short acting agent, at least for 94% of the population. On the non depolarizing side, we have a very promising agent in the ultra short acting category that hasn't quite made it to clinical use yet. It's called Gantacurium and it's in a novel chemical class related to the uh, benzylisoquinoline derivatives and is broken down by a very rapid non enzymatic cysteine adduct mechanism. Its pharmacokinetics suggest it might fit in to the last couple of niche niches currently reserved for succinylmethanium. Next we have mevacurium in the short acting category and atricurium and its purified version cisatricurium in the intermediate. In the long acting group, we have a cyclic benzyl isoquinoline derivative, which I've included for purely historical reasons, tubocurarine. Our last structural category is the amino steroid group, where there are two intermediate acting, vecuronium and rocuronium, 
and one long-acting agent, pancuranium. I'll discuss how these agents differ from each other once we get the inevitable succinamethonium discussion out of the way. Succinamethonium or succinylcholine or scholine or sux is a bad drug, but it's an interesting drug. It's the oldest muscle relaxant that's still in widespread use, which is over 70 years at this point, which gives us our first pros, if you can call it that, which are that it's well studied and that clinicians particularly anaesthetists, are familiar with it. I imagine a significant portion of anaesthetic training is devoted to understanding its bizarre risks and eccentricities. It's also quite cheap to use, which in a better world would not impact decisions related to patient care. And as pointed out on deranged physiology, it comes pre-mixed, which is true of every muscle relaxant except for vecuronium, and is really scraping the barrel of, uh, for points in the pro column. It does have one genuine advantage, which I've already discussed with the bonfire analogy, and that's its mode of action. Because it's activating the end plate and not smothering the receptors, um, it needs less signal to achieve its goal and less molecules to diffuse from the blood, which means faster onset and effective via intramuscular injection. Although you do need to give four times the dose um, and the onset isn't as, as fast as intravenous. It's about one or two minutes. Um, I suspect I might offend some anaesthetists with this section because many are still quite fond of sucks and they like to have it on hand as an emergency drug. For example, if you're delivering anesthesia purely by inhalation and you have an LMA and it causes laryngospasm, you might want an IM option if your IV access stopped working it's a different world and it's not something we'd really encounter in the ICU. I've already talked about how it works. Let's look at how it's broken down. You have butyl cholinesterase in the plasma, which breaks it down to succinyl monocholine, a minor active metabolite with about 5% activity, and then succinic acid with the sequential removal of two choline molecules. This brings it to its more tenuous advantage, which is its short duration of activity action, to which I would add the caveat, usually. And this is where we reach our first idiosyncrasy, which is the so-called sux apnea. Butyl cholinesterase is an enzyme without an obvious endogenous function. It doesn't cause any disease when it's absent in humans at birth. This probably means there's less selective pressure to keep one genotype around, and there are about 65 known variants. So I'm going to talk about four major ones. The first is the wild type, known as EU. Next is an atypical form, EA, also known as dibucane resistant. ES is silent. This is the most severe as it's completely absent. And EF is fluoride resistant, which is rare. This isn't the whole story though. Because we've got two alleles for each gene, um, for any combination of these can exist with different phenotypes. I've color coded them based on severity in the setting of succinamethonium metabolism. In the green, we have the homozygote wild type, which is about 94% of people. They'll have an apnea time of about five minutes. In the yellow, we have heterozygotes with one wild type allele. This basically gives you an incomplete quantitative deficiency as you have at least half a portion of wild type enzyme. This increases the apnea time to about 10 to 20 minutes, which is where you might start running into problems if you were relying on that short duration of action, action for the patient to ventilate. By the way, this is about 5% of the population and we'll go into why it's actually more than that. That's just the genetic ones. Next, you have the rarer types. The orange are the fluoride resistant homozygotes and heterozygotes with minimally functional alleles, and they have an apnea time of about 35 minutes. And finally, there are the red, who are the homozygous severe mutations, EA and ES, or a mixture of the two. They have a very long apnea time, so about two to eight hours, um, as the drug basically needs to find an alternative elimination pathway. The red group represent about one in two um, 2,500 people, so it's not really all that rare. Even more common, though, are 
the acquired quantitative deficiencies. How often do you see one of these groups in the ICU? Liver disease, because the enzyme is made in the liver and severe liver disease malnutrition will reduce um, production. I've included other groups where decreased levels have also been noted, likely by a variety of mechanisms. For example, um, renal disease, cancer, pregnancy, to a mild extent, um, people with burns and post cardiopulmonary bypass. Certain medications such as oral contraceptives, phenylzine, aspirin, metoclopramide can also reduce activity. But the most potent drugs are naturally the cholinesterase inhibitors themselves. Unlike the acquired quantitative deficiencies, drugs like neostigmine or even worse, the irreversible organophosphates can markedly reduce plasma cholinesterase activity to a degree that resembles the severe polymorphisms shown below. This is a significant risk when a patient receives neostigmine for reversal of a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant in theatre, but needs uh, emergent reintubation for some kind of uh, early postoperative complication. For another example, there was a woman in India who was admitted to hospital following deliberate self-poisoning with an organophosphorus-based pesticide. After acute management, she was transferred to a psychiatric unit and diagnosed with severe depression with psychotic features. She was admitted for over a month and failed to improve with medication and psychotherapy, so was planned for ECT. Given the history of an organophosphate overdose, which at this point was 38 days prior, she was given a very small dose of succimethonium, less than 0.3 milligrams per kilo, and she was paralyzed for three hours. And she needed to be vent ventilated by hand with boluses of propofol because they didn't have a ventilator on site at the time. Um, they completed her subsequent sessions with a long acting agent, and at least they knew that she'd need a ventilator those times. One reason prolonged apnea can be so difficult to manage goes back to succimethonium's unpredictable pharmacokinetics, uh, pharmacodynamics. Sorry. Even if providers know to avoid large or repeat doses, if the drug's not broken down, it will often lead to an unpredictable phase two block. These have an inconsistent response to traditional reversal agents. Um, and the main recommendation is just to sedate the patient and wait for the block to resolve on its own. And it's likely, um, likely to be beneficial to use neuromuscular monitoring in this setting. I personally feel that this effectively negates the claimed advantage of succimethonium being short acting. In a heterogeneous population, you can't know that with any confidence. It might be handy if you don't need reversal for, before a neurological examination or if you wanted to extubate someone after a quick procedure, but it should never factor into your plan to oxygenate the patient. I've seen anesthesia textbooks reassure providers that in a well pre-oxygenated patient, Sucks's short duration of action means that in the event of a failed airway, they will easily coast through the five minutes of paralysis and start spontaneously breathing again. This might be true if it is five minutes, but not if it's 20 minutes. If the patient's pregnant or obese or has respiratory disease, you might not even have five minutes. Also, if you do want to prolong a patient's safe apnea time, Activating every skeletal muscle at once probably isn't the best strategy. Generally, if a patient needs intubation in the emergency department or the ICU, it's because right now or very shortly, they will not be able to manage their own airway or ventilate. You don't have the option of letting sucks wear off or waking the patient up, or waking the patient up and canceling the surgery. Um, if they're still having if you're still having trouble intubating the patient, the last thing that you'd need is for the muscle relaxant to partially wear off before you're done. Or if it, that's if they do have the decent levels of wild type cholinesterase. But what if for some unexpected reason you did want to reverse um, your neuromuscular blocking agent immediately after induction? Well, turns out rocuronium and shigamidex are more reliable and faster.
Anyway, I'm getting distracted. I haven't got to the most dangerous side effects. Succinylcholine stimulates muscarinic M2 receptors on the heart, causing a range of arrhythmias from sinus bradycardia to asystole. The risk is higher in children and with multiple doses. It can also stimulate ganglionic receptors, causing um, tachycardia occasionally, but this is a minor effect. It triggers histamine release, which can cause bronchospasm, and it, has ha it does have the highest rate of anaphylaxis of any muscle relaxant currently in use in many settings causing the most perioperative um, anaphylaxis of any drug. Um, rocuronium does come in second though. Other effects come from its depolarizing mode of action causing fasciculations, in some cases masseter spasm. It also seems to form a, cause a more general form of myopathy with a large proportion of patients reporting myalgia post-procedure and many progressing all the way to rhabdomyolysis. Fasciculations can cause persistent uh, potential elevations in intracranial pressure, intraocular pressure and intragastric pressure. The most significant of these seems to be intraocular pressure and likely relates to the unique physiology of extraocular muscles. As mentioned before, succimethonium is also one of the primary triggers for malignant hypothermia, the often lethal genetic syndrome. Finally, we have uh, what is perhaps the most dangerous and limiting of Sux's many adverse effects, which is hyperkalemia. It's quoted as causing around a 0.5 millimole rise in the potassium of most patients, but if they have had an upregulation of their nicotinic receptors, it becomes deadly. Patients at risk include those with functional denervation, either from upper or low, lower motor neuron lesions, immobility, or the effect of muscle relaxants even. Um, interestingly, patients with myasthenia gravis um, are not generally at risk of this, although due to their reduced nicotinic receptors, sucks work significantly slower, which is basically the only thing it had going for it. Um, the other group are people who have basically any disease or inflammation of skeletal muscle, which means anyone with major burns, radiotherapy, trauma, crush injury, muscular dystrophy, muscle tumor, um, I'll, I'll mention muscular dystrophy, by the way, affects one in 3,000 male infants and is not always diagnosed. Um, major surge response from sepsis or pancreatitis, acidosis or renal failure. So these are not uncommon in ICU. Um, some of the conditions like muscular dystrophy will also increase the risk of rab acute rhabdomyolysis, which will worsen the hyperkalemia. Significant immobility and neuromyopathy are particular risk factors for ICU patients and they get worse over time. One study found a clear increase in measured potassium post sucks with a length with with length of ICU stay and a dramatic increase after 16 days. Um, to see how this hyperkalemia happens, we'll go back to skeletal muscle. So now we're back looking at some motor units. With inflammation or neuronal loss due to those various conditions, muscles can express more nicotinic receptors. These are all over the plasma membrane and no longer just at the former neuro neuromuscular junction. It makes some physiological sense as if the muscle is reaching out to find a new source of acetylcholine to activate it. The receptors are often the immature heteromeric type, subtype and the homomeric alpha-7 type. While the only viable option, these patients may see a decreased effect of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants as they are mopped up by these extra receptors. Depolarizing relaxants are a different story though. All of these receptors just open and the entire membrane depolarizes and a flood of potassium is released, causing the plasma concentration to rise catastrophically. From a case report in The Lancet, a 58-year-old was hospitalized in an ICU in France where he received mechanical ventilation for ARDS secondary to influenza.
After 31 days, he was extubated, but the following day deteriorated and the decision was made to reintubate with RSI. From the previous slide, we can tell that after 31 days of mechanical ventilation, he is at exceedingly high risk of neuromuscular weakness and associated hyperkalemia with sucks, although he reportedly didn't have any evidence of this. So he was given one milligram per kilo of succimethonium. His pre-intubation potassium was 3.5 millimoles per litre, and I will now show you his ECG trace in real time while the tube was going in. So his potassium is now 9.6. He had a VF cardiac arrest. The team performed CPR along with medical therapy for hyperkalemia, and thankfully he recovered. If the patient does survive, the succinylcholine will diffuse off to be broken down, and the potassium will eventually return to the muscle fibers with the sodium potassium ATPase. Anyway, I think it's a bad drug. I prefer agents that are less likely to stop my patient's heart. Diehard defenders might suggest that you can mitigate the vast assortment of deadly risks by carefully selecting patients, stockpiling dantrolene, and pre-treating with a bespoke cocktail of atropine and defasciculating doses of better muscle relaxants, but I think that way madness lies. Speaking of better muscle relaxant, no, 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 this is uh, tubocurarine. It's obsolete due to significant ganglionic block histamine release and very slow onset and offset of action. I put it here to illustrate the double ammonium structure that's a common feature of neuromuscular blocking agents, even succinethonium. Another way to achieve similar ge geometry is by incorporating a steroid structure. This wasn't rational drug design, it was the 60s, so they got the idea from another South American plant, uh, Malautia. Anyway, it gave us the amino steroid class of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. The first was pancuronium, a very potent and long-acting agent with few side effects other than causing a modest increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Next was vecuronium, which had similar potency but was shorter acting and lacked the vagalytic effects of pancuronium. With the loss of one formal charge, it's the most lipophilic muscle relaxant and unstable in aqueous solution, so needs reconstitution. While time consuming, it does make storage easier as it's stable at room temperature. It's still widely used today. A problem with vecuronium is that it usually takes up to two minutes to work unless you give large doses, which prolongs its duration of action. In pharmacology, a large quantity of a low potency drug diffuses to the effect site and therefore works faster than a small quantity of an equivalently potent drug. This is probably why one of the least potent IV opioids, pethidine, was notorious for creating intense euphoria and having a high abuse potential. Developers modified vecuronium, reducing its potency about five to eight fold to make rocuronium, which needs to be given in a larger dose. This was successful with a time to intubating conditions of about 60 seconds, making it suitable for RSI. It's also more stable in solution and can be kept in a ready to use form. Other advantages of the amino steroids are minimal histamine release, and particularly for VEC and ROC, reversibility with Shigamidex. The last group of non-depolarizing agents are the benzyl isoquinoline-based agents. I've gone back to the tubocurarine molecule because it's actually a cyclic version which contains two of the same aromatic structures for which the class is named. Now, if you want to get super pedantic, it's actually a benzyl tetrahydroisoquinoline group because the ring with the nitrogen in it is an aromatic. If you connect the halves together, um, via the uh, ammonium groups and unravel the molecule, you will essentially get atricurium. Now, the two structures below are besylate, which serve to balance the charge, like bromide or, bromide or chloride. This class do not have significant muscarinic or ganglionic effects and have interesting elimination because they're not primarily eliminated via the liver or kidneys. Atricurium is broken down by a roughly equal mix of 
non-specific esterases and a process referred to as Hoffman elimination, which is simple non-enzymatic chemical process. This means that while it has a similar duration of action to rocuronium and vecuronium, its kinetics are far more consistent in patients with renal or hepatic disease. In theory, atricurium has a metabolite laudanosine, which can lower the seizure threshold, although this needs to be in quite high doses. Atricurium can also trigger slight histamine release. All of these agents are relatively slow onset, around two to three minutes, which makes them less suitable as induction agents. A distinctive element is their chirality. Atricurium has four chiral sensors, and in general, the number of stereoisomers for a molecule will be two to the power of that number of chiral sensors. For atricurium, this would be 16, but some are redundant due to symmetry, which gives 10. Therefore, the drug atricurium is a mixture of 10 different isomers with various potencies and effects. Here they are. Now, the R-cis-R-cis -cis isomer is known less formally as cis-atricurium, and it's the most potent form. Cis-atricurium is used in its amantia pure form as a muscle relaxant, which eliminates most of the disadvantages of atricurium. It does not cause histamine release, and laudanosine is completely negligible due to the very small doses required. It doesn't have a particularly faster onset as expected for a more potent drug, although it can be given in a relatively higher doses to compensate due to less histamine release than atricurium. In terms of metabolism, cis-atricurium is primarily eliminated through Hoffman degrad degradation. Cis-atricurium is the drug of choice as an adjunct to mechanical ventilation in ICU, primarily due to its organ-independent kinetics and relative lack of adverse effects. In practice and clinical trials, it tends to be given as an infusion, ideally guided by neuromuscular monitoring. There has been speculation that this class may have a lower rate of critical illness associated with neuromuscular weakness compared with the aminosteroids, but this has not been verified. Like many ICU interventions, evidence for any neuromuscular blockade being beneficial in patients with ARDS is somewhat mixed. Mevacurium is a very interesting drug because of it is the shortest acting non-depolarizing muscle relaxant currently available without the aid of reversal agents, lasting about half as long as the intermediate agents, but longer than succimethonium. It's a mixture of three isomers with slightly different kinetics and pharmacodynamically resembles atricurium with a similar onset and risk of histamine release. The main disadvantage is one that it shares with succimethonium that it is dependent on butyral cholinesterase for its metabolism. Patients with a severely abnormal phenotype, for example, through those red po uh, genetic polymorphisms that we listed, can have a vastly prolonged duration of action by many hours. The block can be partially reversed with cholinesterase inhibitors, but most also inhibit the elimination of mevacurium, so this can be unpredictable. I suspect that if gansacurium is successful, it might make mevacurium redundant due to its faster and cholinesterase independent metabolism. Now, here's a summary table for comparison purposes. Of note, the intermediate duration agents all have virtually the same duration of action in the absence of significant renal or hepatic disease. The curiums, as I choose to call them, have higher rates of histamine release, although for cis it's effectively absent, and rocuronium and pancuronium have some vagolytic activity. Tubocurarine is present out of historical interest. We're now going to look a bit closer at acetylcholinesterase and cholinesterase inhibitors, though I won't cover them in as much detail as the neuromuscular blockers. This is a schematic of the enzyme's active site, which is composed primarily of three amino acid side chains known as a catalytic triad. We've discussed how this enzyme clears acetylcholine extremely efficiently. This is how it happens. The first step is that the ester is cleaved, leaving um, 
with the acetate group attaching to the serine at the esteratic site. Step two is that the acetic acid group is rapidly hydrolyzed off the serine, freeing up the active site to be used again. Cholinesterase inhibitors can be divided most fundamentally by their mode of inhibition, rapidly reversible, slowly reversible, and irreversible. Other important characteristics are whether they can be absorbed from the GI tract, whether they cross the blood-brain barrier, their relative affinities for acetyl and butyl cholinesterase, and their elimination kinetics. The first group are the rapidly reversible, traditionally, they are traditional reversible enzyme inhibitors. An example is edrophonium, which is sometimes better known by the brand name Tensilon. It simply competes with acetylcholine at the active site and doesn't bind. As a result of this and its pharmacokinetics, the effect is very short-lived. It is sometimes used for the reversal of neuromuscular blockade, and it was previously used to help diagnose myasthenia gravis as a therapeutic trial, or to differentiate myasthenic from cholinergic crises in patients who are on cholinesterase inhibitors. In both cases, if they got better, that was considered diagnostic of myasthenia. A cholinergic crisis with excess cholinesterase inhibitor would naturally get worse. Due to the quaternary ammonium group, edrophonium cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. This is a good thing because its uses are only at the neuromuscular junction, and this would just cause side effects. Centrally acting cholinesterase inhibitors appear to have some symptomatic benefit in Alzheimer's disease. Donepazil, also known as Aricept, is one example. It's a reversible inhibitor like edrophonium, and it can cross, except it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Now the next group are called slowly reversible or pseudo-irreversible, and include neostigmine. It bears a striking resemblance to edrophonium, although it is an ester with a carbamoyl group. These drugs have an identical mode of action to carbamate pesticides. They basically act as a substrate for cholinesterase, like acetylcholine, except they leave the carbamoyl group on the serine and it takes much longer to cleave back off. This leaves the active site uh, non-functional until the group can be hydrolyzed away. From what I can tell, this takes about 30 minutes give or take, which is about a million times slower than the acetyl group of acetylcholine. So you can probably imagine that this causes a profound impairment of acetylcholine breakdown. Neostigmine and peridostigmine are both in this class and can be used to treat myasthenia gravis. They both have a formal charge and don't cross the blood-brain barrier, but the charge on peridostigmine is part of the aromatic group which seems to help make it permeable enough for better oral absorption. Neostigmine and edrophonium are the primary cholinesterase inhibitors used to reverse neuromuscular blockade as they are given IV, don't cross the blood-brain barrier, and are relatively short-acting. Meanwhile, physostigmine and rivastigmine do, do cross the blood-brain barrier because they don't have any formal charge. Rivastigmine has also been used for dementia treatment. Physostigmine is a pretty niche drug at this point. Mostly you don't want these CNS side effects, although they do have one remaining use. If you think back to those prisoners who drank atropine, they were comatose and they needed a reversal agent that could cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's used in toxicology, specifically to reverse anticholinergic delirium or coma. Now you might wonder about how often this happens, but we had a great example in my country recently. Last year, a commercial spinach farm in Victoria, Australia, was contaminated with invasive datura plants, also known as thorn apple, devil's trumpet, or gypsum, gypsum weed. It contains various toxic alkaloids, including scopolamine and atropine. This was harvested and sold with baby spinach leaves. At least 190 people across multiple states developed anticholinergic toxidromes leading to many hospitalizations, but no deaths. These chemicals are highly toxic. It just depends on context. The carbamates are also used as insecticides, such as carbaryl. They are the less deadly um, than the organophosphate pesticides, but can cause a similar toxidrome of shorter acting.
shorter duration. So what is the toxidrome from a carbamate pesticide or physostigmine? You have a huge overabundance of acetylcholine at cholinergic synapses, which means that you have a parasympathetic toxidrome plus diaphoresis from peripheral muscarinic sympathetic receptors. Um, do you remember the effects of these? Bradycardia, smooth muscle constriction, glandular secretion. As a result, you have secretion from every orifice, sweating, lacrimation, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, diarrhea. It's not pleasant. You also get indirect autonomic effects from ganglionic um, nicotinic receptors and in high enough doses you will see paradoxical neuromuscular weakness akin to succinylcholine. If they cross the blood-brain barrier they cause all kinds of central muscarinic and nicotinic effects with altered mental status, respiratory depression and seizures. The cause of death in anticholinesterase is poisoning is almost always respiratory failure due to bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, and central depression. Neostigmine is sometimes used for its prokinetic properties. It's so effective that it's pretty notorious among ICU nurses, um, though it can't be used if there's a chance of GI obstruction. Most of the time though, you don't want muscarinic effects. So if it's used for neuromuscular applications, you need to give it with an anti-muscarinic drug like atropine or glycopyrrolate. Carbaryl, or 7, has another unfortunate distinction due to its manufacturing process. It's made by adding a carbamoyl group to one naphthol, and this group comes in the form of methyl isocyanate. While not a cholinesterase inhibitor, it is extremely reactive and toxic in its own right. In 1984, a Union Carbide facil uh, factory producing carbaryl in Bhopal, India, caused the worst industrial disaster in human history. Through extreme negligence and disregard for human life, a massive tank of MIC vented into the atmosphere in a densely populated region. Over half a million people were exposed, leading to an estimated 16 to 20,000 deaths. Now we move on to the irreversible organophosphates. These can get really nasty and it becomes a very fine line between drug, pesticide and weapon of mass destruction. I could find three drugs that have been used topically for glaucoma and for research purposes. All of them are very systemically toxic and all except echothiopate are centrally active. Paraoxone is an active metabolite of the pesticide paratheon and it's considered a nerve agent in its own right. A commonly used pesticide in this class is malathion. Then you have some of the scariest chemicals ever made, such as sarin, VX, and the Novichok agents, which are probably the worst of all. Organophosphate insecticides are a common cause of accidental and deliberate poisoning in many parts of the world, and even nerve agents are still around and used occasionally. In the 1980s, nerve agents were used by Iraq against military and civilian targets. In the 1990s, Om Shinrikyo in Japan used sarin in two public attacks. Nerve agents were used in Syria in 2013 and 2017. VX was used in an assassination in Malaysia in 2017. And a Novichok agent was used in an assassination in England in 2018. The reason that they're so horrifically toxic is their mode of action at the active site. I'll use sarin as an example. It's initially similar to neostigmine, except the whole molecule attaches to the estratic site. I'll talk more about treatment shortly, but there is an opportunity to intervene once someone is exposed. There's a class of chemicals called oxames like pralidoxime or Hdon oxames, known as HI6 or HI7, used as antidotes to certain organophosphates. Pralidoxine is known as 2PAM and is part of nerve agent antidote kits used by militaries along with atropine and diazepam. Pralidoxime works on this intermediate state and plucks the nerve agent back off the active site, forming a new ester complex. It has to be given pretty quickly though. If it's not given in time, something else happens. 
the agent forms an active site complex like before, but then it spontaneously hydrolyzes, leaving just a phosphonyl group. This process is called aging and leaves you with a dead enzyme. At this point, the body just needs to make more. The aging process depends on the agent in question. For example, most pesticides, it can take 24 to 48 hours, and it's similar for certain nerve agents like Tabin and VX. Sarin has an aging half-life of about five hours, so paladoxine needs to be given a bit faster. But the chemists kept making nastier agents. So we have Soman, for example, which is similar to Sarin, but has an aging half-life of two minutes, which is pretty evil. From what I can tell, the Novichok agents have a similarly short aging time. At this point, you would probably need paladoxime at the time of exposure, it's not going to work. There is a pretty clever pharmacological option to try and prevent severe toxicity with one of these agents, and that is to take either pyridostigmine or physostigmine preemptively along with an anti-muscarin ink. Effectively, you are choosing a less lethal way to inhibit acetylcholinesterase as the carbamoyl group will temporarily prevent the nerve agent from attaching and then it will attach, detach on its own over the next couple of hours. Apart from oxime therapy and benzodiazepines to prevent seizures, the mainstay of treatment are anti-muscarinic drugs, usually atropine in large doses titrated to respiratory symptoms. The acute life-threatening illness can last for days with changes in plasma and red blood cell cholinesterase lasting weeks as we saw in the ECT succimethonium case. Central nervous system effects may last even longer and it's recommended all patients undergo neuropsychiatric evaluation before discharge. So what are our anti-muscarinic drugs? They are used in toxicology and anesthesia to offset the muscarinic effects of cholinesterase inhibitors. They can also be used symptomatically in the treatment of bradycardia, some kinds of nausea, smooth muscle spasm, and for drying secretions, particularly in palliative care. I'm going to run through two natural and two synthetic agents for comparison. Atropine and scopolamine are our natural versions. Scopolamine is also known as hyacine and is sometimes described as hyacine hydrobromide, which simply refers to its formulation as an acidic ionic compound. Confusingly, Butyl scopolamine, a different molecule with a butyl group covalently added, is sometimes described as hyacine butyl bromide, which would imply it's a different formulation of the same drug. They, they are very different. If you're in America, you probably have methyl scopolamine instead of butyl scopolamine, which I think works in a similar fashion. An immediate point of distinction is whether or not they cross the blood-brain barrier. Atropine does to some extent, giving it mild anti-nausea properties and some additional efficacy in organophosphate poisoning. Scopolamine does to the greatest extent, causing significant sedation and delirium. It's responsible for much of the CNS effects of Datura, for example, and has been used for drug facilitated robbery and assault. In the medical setting, it's often a disadvantage, although it does have a niche in the treatment of motion sickness. Glycopyrrolate and butyl scopolamine do not to any significant extent, as you should probably be able to tell by this point because they have a formal charge. Another important distribution question is whether they cross the placenta, which is true for atropine and scopolamine, but minimal for the two synthetic agents. In anesthesia, this is relevant because neostigmine may cross the placenta to a small extent. So atropine would be the anti-muscarinic drug of choice in that case if you're worried about causing fetal bradycardia. Speaking of which, atropine has the greatest vagolytic effect on heart rate. I've mentioned before that nausea is tied to the CNS penetration, although butyl scopolamine may have some efficacy as an antispasmodic. And scopolamine and glycopyrrolate have the greatest anti-secretion effects. I've put up a brief overview of their pharmacokinetics, which become very important in anesthesia, as well as some typical doses. If you're giving a cholinesterase inhibitor for reversal of neuromuscular blockade, the main cholinergic side effects you're worried about is going to be bradycardia.
which means your two choices are going to be atropine and glycopyrrolate. Despite atropine having the most potent relative effect on heart rate, you need to match the kinetics of the drug that you're treating, and subtle timing becomes important. Atropine has an onset time of around one minute and a relatively large volume of distribution. Glycopyrrolate has an onset of two to three minutes and a slightly longer effective duration. When given with neostigmine, atropine causes more initial tachycardia and subsequent bradycardia, as the onset and offset are slightly too fast to match neostigmine. As a result, neostigmine tends to be given with glycopyrrolate, although atropine does seem better timed when it's given with edrophonium. Cholinesterase inhibitors are used to reverse neuromuscular blockade by a, pharmaco, by a pharmacodynamic mechanism, but there's a relative newcomer that uses a pharmacokinetic mechanism instead. So this is Figamidex. It's an extremely reliable reversal agent for rocuronium with a reasonable affinity for vecuronium and limited for pancuronium. It's not effective for any other class of neuromuscular blocking agent. Its effect is due to its novel cyclic dextran structure. It's shaped like a funnel with a lipophilic core and negatively charged hydrophilic arms on the outside. When it encounters rocuronium, the lipophilic steroid structure enters the core while the arms associate with the positive nitrogen group, trapping it like a cage. This prevents the drug from having any further effect until the complex of both molecules is eliminated. If you look back at the neuromuscular junction, which is now full of aminosteroid muscle relaxant in equilibrium with plasma, Shigamidex shows up and it immediately grabs all of the drug in the plasma, creating a concentration gradient which pulls the active neuromuscular blockers back into the bloodstream and into the Shigamidex sink. This can fully reverse even an RSI dose of rocuronium in two to three minutes. You just need to dose it based on roughly how much drug is left in the body as each Shigamidex molecule binds one aminosteroid molecule. Adverse effects include bradycardia in about 1% of patients, which can be marked in some cases. It seems to have about a 1 in 3,000 or 0.03% risk of anaphylaxis, similar to that of rocuronium or succimethonium. It can increase clotting initiation time by about 10 to 20%, although not other parameters on thromboelastography and may have a small increase in clinical bleeding. It can trap progesterone, so it may affect uh, contraceptive efficacy. It has been speculated that certain drugs, such as antibiotics, may displace the muscle relaxant, leading to recurarization. But I haven't seen any evidence of this actually happening, and it's much more likely to occur as a result of underdosing Shigamidex. It's also quite expensive, but that's not really a science issue. Last section, how do we know how paralyzed our patients are? We're going to look at neuromuscular monitoring. This is a very important topic in anesthesia, as well as when neuromuscular blocking drugs are used in ICU. Post-operative residual curarization, as it is known, may be present in 20 to 60% of patients in post-anesthetic recovery units. It's highly associated with post-operative respiratory complications as it reduces respiratory volumes, upper airway, pharyngeal and esophageal tone, and can decrease hypoxic respiratory drive by blocking nicotinic receptors in carotid bodies. This leads to an increased risk of hypoxia, atelectasis, and aspiration. Most non-depolarizing muscle relaxants have a longer duration of action than typical general anesthetics. There is substantial substantial in, intra, intra, individual variability in their pharmacokinetics and clinical examination is grossly inadequate to assess the degree of residual blockade. Neuromuscular monitoring is also needed to guide dosing of reversal agents. As I just mentioned, you need an idea of how much amino steroid is re remaining to give uh, Shigamidex. This is even more important for cholinesterase inhibitors as they are ineffective for reversal of deep block and need to be matched to the expected degree and duration of the patient's recovery as both little, too little and too much nicotinic stimulation can cause weakness. Neuromuscular monitoring is performed by stimulating motor neurons and measuring the degree of response from the muscle. 
This provides an assessment of the efficacy of transmission through the neuromuscular junction. A common site for stimulation is the ulnar nerve with assessment of contraction of the adductor pollicis muscle, which it innervates. Electrodes are placed on the ulnar side of the wrist overlying the nerve. A small battery powered generator applies a short burst of current, typically 50 to 80 milliamps, to induce a supramaximal stimulus to the nerve. This activates all of the motor neurons at once, delivering an action potential, which should manifest as a twitch in the dependent muscle fibers if transmission is intact. As mentioned before, different muscles have different composition and innervation and therefore respond differently to neuromuscular blocking drugs. You'll see this diagram in every anesthetic textbook showing that the time course of recovery from paralysis in the adductor pollicis can lag by several minutes behind more critical muscles like the larynx. As the former has become the standard, it provides a degree of assurance that if the hand is recovered, it's very likely the airway muscles have as well. So how do, I, how do we assess the twitches? One method is to just look or feel them manually, although you can get far more information by measuring it quantitatively, and there's a few options for this. The best established is known as mechanomyography, and it's holding the thumb at a fixed abduction and measuring the tension with a force gauge. It's accurate, but it's a bit bulky for an operating theater. You can go to the other extreme and tape a tiny accelerometer to the thumb and extrapolate the movement from there. You can use another set of electrodes and measure the electrical discharge from the muscle itself. This is actually a form of EMG and qualitatively somewhat different to the others. There's also a more compact variation of mechanomyography, which measures the angle between thumb and forefinger and has been named kinemyography. I'll be using this one in the demonstration from a fictional brand. There are variations between the outputs of the different types, but the takeaway points are that monitoring is far better than no monitoring and quantitative is better than subjective. Now the most basic form is single twitch stimulation. You apply a pulse and measure the amplitude. The problem is that unless you've measured a baseline amplitude pre-paralysis, you don't have a point of comparison and all you can really tell is, is there a twitch or not? But they've come up with some cool ideas on how to get some more information. The first and most well known is known as the train of four. This uses the effect of non-depolarizing agents we've mentioned before, which is fade. Fade is a decreased amplitude with subsequent contractions. It is more marked with increasing frequency of stimulation and increasing degree of block. A train of four is four pulses, each lasting 0.2 milliseconds at two hertz, which means they're about 0.5 seconds apart. There's nothing special about the number four, it's just that fade tends to reach its maximal extent around there, so that's how they've standardized it. Now let's see what happens with no muscle relaxant present, just and therefore 0% receptor occupancy. All of the twitches are present and the same amplitude. This is also the pattern seen with Suxmethonium's typical phase one block. The twitches will be reduced, but consistent amplitude and without fade. You can't use a train of four to assess a depolarizing agent, although you can use it to identify the presence of phase two block. Train of four is relatively insensitive at very low levels of block, which matches our understanding of large degree of receptor occupancy needed to impair transition for non-depolarizing agents. Up to around 60%, you won't see any effect at all. At 65%, the amplitude is going to decrease very slightly. And at 70%, you can see the first clear evidence of fade. This is why you can't just count the twitches. Despite relatively high occupancy, this effect is very subtle. We measure it by dividing the amplitude of the fourth twitch by the amplitude of the first. If it's a quantitative monitor, it should calculate this and display it for you. Now we're at 75% occupancy and the monitor is giving a ratio of 0.85. This is still way too subtle for a human to detect manually, but this would be considered um, residual post-operative curarization and associated with adverse outcomes. Now we're at 80% with a ratio of 0.53. Most humans still can't detect this by touch. Once we're at 
85% receptor occupancy, we lose the fourth twitch. Above this, we can't calculate a ratio and have to just count the twitches. As we pass 90%, we're losing the next two twitches. The exact um, receptor occupancy is an estimate and will vary between patients. I'm including it for conceptual understanding, but in practice, we go by the monitoring. And between around 95 and 100% receptor occupancy, as you see, uh, you can't get any further twitches from trainer four. Let's try an example with the stimulator. Imagine you're an anaesthetist on an elective case. You gave rocuronium on induction about 50 minutes ago. The surgeon's finished and the patient's breathing up on the ventilator and moving spontaneously. Is it safe to extubate them and send them to recovery? Now, if you were just counting the twitches, you would get four, which would be pretty unhelpful, and, but you'd probably notice there was a bit of fade by the last one. Measuring the ratio shows that the patient has a marked residual block, which would be unsafe by, for extubation by any criteria and needs reversal. It's now advised that patients should be at a trainer four ratio of 0 0.9 or greater before they are considered safe. Different scenario, you have a patient deeply unconscious under general anesthetic and you're, you've given a dose of vecuronium about 20 minutes ago. Surgeon is performing a delicate neurosurgical procedure and requests that the patient be paralyzed completely to prevent any unexpected movements. So we fire up the train of four stimulator and get nothing, no twitches. How paralyzed are they? We know they're deeply paralyzed. I mean, the receptor occupancy is probably over 95%, but is that enough? The thumb doesn't perfectly match the movements of the diaphragm, so it's possible they could still move. What if we were thinking about reversing a patient? If they'd had a huge overdose of neuromuscular blocker, they'd still get zero twitches. We need a different technique. We've talked about fade, but there's another effect we can use called post-tetanic potentiation. If you increase your stimulus frequency, you can still see fade, but after a decent burst of testimony, it can amplify subsequent twitches. So then you can see them even under a deep block. To do this, you apply a tetanic st stimulation for five seconds, wait for three seconds, then apply repeated stimuli at one per second, usually for a total of 20. All you have to do then is count the number of twitches. Here we go. So that's a post-tetanic count of eight after all that potentiation wore off. That means it's still a deep block, but not profound. In fact, patients usually get their tra first train of four twitch back at around a PTC of eight to 10. In the neurosurgical example, they might need additional relaxant with this count. Once the post-tetanic count reaches zero, the block is considered complete. Re receptor occupancy will be very close to 100% at that stage. So now for an overview of neuromuscular monitoring. We don't get an awful lot from single twitch as you need to compare it to baseline. You can use it for a depolarizing block, although that's, that's all you can use. Um, and it's only for sucks, only for phase one. You wouldn't need to monitor them unless you were going at risk of going into phase two where things get a bit less clear. In general, most of these techniques you'd use for non-depolarizing agents. Um, and also, while the graph looks very clear, it's very hard to tell the magnitude of these, so it's mostly twitch or no twitch. To assess things better, we can do a train of four count, um, and we're looking for where it goes from four to three to two to one to zero. And that gives you a reasonable discrimination between um, 88 to 94% roughly, um, but it's pretty narrow. Um, it's much better if you use the ratio, which is for a, a, um, a count of four. Um, if, as soon as you've got a count of four, you can do the ratio and quantify it better. Um, and it shows how really superior the quantitative techniques are for detecting fade. A human can't manually tell the difference between a ratio of 0 0.4 and 0 0.9. Um, 
you might see another technique used for um, this reason, which is double burst stimulation. It uses a set of two brief bursts of current at 50 hertz, 750 milliseconds apart. In a quantitative sense, it doesn't give you any different information to a trainer for, um, but to a subjective observer, the difference between one burst and the second is more obvious than the difference between one uh, twitch one and twitch four. Um, so it means that you can manually detect fade to a ratio of about um, 0 0.6 instead. Although you need 0 0.9 in the perioperative setting, so don't use a, use a quantitative ratio. At the high end, we have post tetanic count. You can use, um, you can also use in, uh, increasing frequencies of testing to detect fade with very faint blocks. The downside of this is limited clinical relevance and the fact that tetany is often unbearably painful and the post-anesthetic patient is quite likely to be conscious at that point if you're assessing extremely mild blocks. Um, although I have seen discussion of using it to exclude blockade during possible brain death assessment, and it would be very sensitive for that if, if, that, was, um, if that was required. Um, using combination of train of four ratio, train of four count and post tetanic count, you can classify the block with a reasonable degree of precision. Um, there's different sets of categories. Um, I'm gonna use a proposed schema from a group in Zurich, but they're all quite similar. Um, at the high end, we've got a complete block, which is a post tetanic count of zero. Um, next, we've got profound block, post tetanic count of one to three. Deep block is a train of four count of zero, but a PTC of four or greater. Now we have moderate, which is also known as surgical block. This might be the typical level you keep a patient at during surgery. It's also about where you aim for um, if you were paralyzing a patient in ICU for ARDS. Now, an advantage of this level is that if you had a simple non-quantitative nerve stimulator, you could just aim to keep the train of four count around one to two, and then you'd still be able to stay in that range without a ratio or any kind of measurement. Um, once we get the fourth twitch, but a ratio of less than 0 0.4, it's considered shallow block, and between 0.4 and 0.9 is quite minimal block, but it's still too much for a patient to safely manage. Anything above a ratio of 0 0.9 is considered recovery. Being able to assess the degree of blockade combined with an understanding of the pharmacokinetics and trajectory of the um, drug in question um, can allow you to um, follow, um, follow what level they're at at any given time and assess whether they need reversing and how much reversal agent they require. Um, so here's an example algorithm for non-depolarizing agents. Notice that the cholinesterase inhibitors are not recommended for deep block or, or greater. And even above this um, range, uh, even, even sort of more shallow than this range, um, edrophonium may be too short acting for some of the longer acting agents. Um, for rocuronium or vecuronium, any degree of block can be re reversed with shigamidex, but you just need to dose it appropriately. Now that's it. To summarize some major points, action potential is driven by uh, sodium influx, potassium efflux, and calcium ties it to cellular mechanisms. Muscle tension is controlled through action potential frequency and sequential recruitment of motor units. Myasthenia gravis functionally resembles the effect of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Acetylcholine has numerous roles and receptors in the autonomic, somatic, and central nervous system. Reversal agents need to match the distribution and timing of the drug you're trying to reverse uh, uh, in order to match the, um, match the effects. Succimethonium is unpredictable and dangerous and would never be approved today. Uh, secondary plasma cholinesterase deficiency is quite common. Uh, Mevacurium and succimethonium are metabolized by the same enzyme. Cisatricurium, probably the ideal muscle relaxant for ICU patients, um, apart from uh, uh, for induction.
Neuromuscular blockade should be reversed to a train of four ratio of greater than 0.9 if the patient's being extubated. Neuromuscular blocking agents should be dosed on, based on the depth of blockade, uh, both for Sugamidex and the cholinesterase inhibitors. And cholinesterase inhibitors can cause neuromuscular weakness if um, given in excess. If your patient is paralyzed, they need to be sedated. Self-explanatory. Now I'm going to plug some books and resources I like. Check out all the usual places. Deranged Physiology is amazing. Uh, LibGen, Sci-Hub. Um, check out Open Anesthesia. It's a free online resource for anesthesia topics. Stanford Medicine has a site for their anesthesia program. Some of it needs a login, but they have a downloadable textbook, which is 100 pages of lecture slides from 2022 on basic anesthesia. And I'll put that link in the description. Um, there's a bunch of other lectures on YouTube. I recommend um, Ketamine Nightmares. They don't have a huge amount of um, videos, but the neuromuscular monitoring one was very good. Um, check out David Goodsell's paper and awesome illustrations that I had in the intro. Um, now, I used a bunch of books. Uh, Boron and Bolpap had very good descriptions of the autonomic ganglion transmission, Guyton and Hall, obviously. Fundamental Neuroscience is an awesome book, had good visual descriptions of a very difficult topic. Um, a couple of other neurophysiology books. If you like action potentials, I'd check out the electrophysiology one. Um, muscle and Exercise Physiology is my core skeletal muscle book, sort of like my vascular smooth muscle one I mentioned before. I've already plugged the ACSM book. It's quite technical and comprehensive. Um, Neuromuscular Fundamentals is a cool book. It takes a kind of conceptual engineering interdisciplinary approach to the topic, which is um, different. Um, neuromuscular Disorders, it was uh, very good, especially for the myasthenia stuff. Um, the main text for this entire presentation I used was Miller's Anesthesia. It's great, but it's obviously huge and expensive. Um, if you want something more compact and targeted, Peck and Harris would be my recommendation especially the chapter on neuromuscular blockade. Um, there's a few other books on anesthetic pharmacology that I used. General pharmacology, Goodman and Gilman had a nice description of ganglion blocks, which is a fairly obscure topic. Uh, Janeway's immunobiology is an old favorite that I use for the complement cascade. Finally, I referenced this book on chemical weapons regarding organophosphates. Honorable mention to critical care toxicology as well, which didn't fit on the slide. And I used like a ton, hundreds of journal articles. Now, thank you for watching. Believe it or not, this one started out with the intention of being one slide, not 74. Never mind, it was pretty fascinating and I learned a lot. I promise that the next video will be shorter and hopefully out sooner. I'm still transitioning to single concept topics instead of rambling deep dives. Uh, please subscribe and share with others. If you found it useful or have other feedback, please let me know in the comments.